you're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Marvin? Yes, sir. What do you think you're doing? I'm moving the table, sir. Why, whatever for? The party, Mr. Fitzgerald. Party? What party? Mrs. Fitzgerald, sir, for her birthday. Oh, good Lord, is that tonight? I understand that it is. You instructed me to see to the arrangement, sir. Oh, so I did, so I did. I suppose you'll transform this apartment into a veritable wonderland. Paper streamers and the like. No, sir. Just a buffet for the guests, as soon as the delivery boy arrives downstairs. The guests? Those on the list, sir. Small gathering of your closest friends. Then it'll be a very small gathering indeed. Sit down, Marvin, before you fall down. Very well, sir. On second thought, fix me a drink. As you wish. Now, I suppose I must go out and purchase a gift for the poor girl. Unless you've taken care of that for me. You, uh, you left no instructions in that regard. Well, you might have simply asked her what she desires for the momentous occasion. But I couldn't. Then she'd know. Ah, oh, all right. Let me see. What does she need? Books? No, oh, too many of those. All they do is gather dust. A trinket? A bauble? Diamonds are quite dear these days. If I might offer a suggestion. Why not? Well, Mrs. Fitzgerald has expressed an interest in music. Oh, she has, has she? What does she know about music? I will not have popular ditties polluting my environment. Not recording, sir. I believe she'd like to play. <laughs> what? A glockenspiel? A, a, a kettle drum? You'd have to ask Mrs. Fitzgerald, but she did say it has powers to soothe the savage beast. That's breast, man, the savage breast. Do you see any beasts around here? Uh, if you don't mind, sir, I'll repair to my quarters for a while until the provisions arrive. Did you put soda in this drink? Oh, I, I, uh... I've told you, Marvin, no soda. Make me another one at once, and this time do it properly. Yes, sir. Mr. Fitzgerald Fortune, theater critic and cynic at large, on the day of his wife's birthday. If he knew what's in store for him, however, he would make it a point not to attend. Because before the party is over, an extraordinary instrument will play what might be called those old piano roll blues. An opening night that could only happen in the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, A Piano in the House. Starring Michael York with Stacy Keach as your narrator. <clears throat> yeah? How do you do? If you don't see a price tag, ask. <clears throat> I am Fitzgerald Fortune. So? The drama critic. Uh-huh. Isn't rudeness a handicap in your line of work? What's it to you? I saw the name of your shop, Treasures Unlimited. I stepped through the door, fully expecting to encounter some sentimental old biddy wearing an ostrich-plumed hat and a moth-eaten feather boa. Instead, to my sincere delight, I believe I've discovered a fellow misanthrope. What's that? A man who despises people. I got work to do, mister. Putting up stock. And I am meant to be writing a review this very hour for tomorrow's edition. So why aren't you doing it? Life intervenes. 
looking for something in particular. A gift for my wife's birthday. Well, you're in the wrong place. This isn't a gift shop. It's a junk store. <laughs> exactly. You see, my wife has the absurd notion that she wants to learn to play an instrument. Unfortunately, she hasn't a trace of talent. How do you know that? Hmm? If you've never heard her play. I believe I know my own wife. However, I've hit upon a rather droll solution to her dilemma. Do you have, by any chance, one of those old-fashioned pianos that plays itself? A player piano? Funny you should ask. Amuse me. I just picked one up at an estate sale. Over here. It's kind of beat up, though. Splendid. Needs a good toning. <laughs> Nonsense. My wife will believe it to be an antique and cherish it all the more. Would you play something, please? I can't play. Takes these paper rolls. Came with a whole bunch of them. Right in the piano bench. Ah. Rachmaninoff's Prelude in C-sharp minor. Stephen Foster. UB Blake. Even the Prisoner's Song. Hmm. Quite an eclectic assortment. You're taking a lot of my time, mister. You are taking an equal amount of mine. Let's try this roll. Shall we number QRS-8856? I'm in the mood for love. Okay. There we go. birthday does this make for the little woman? Hmm? Your wife. Oh, her 26. So young. You must be a man of great personal magnetism to have attracted one of that age. I am. <laughs> How utterly romantic. Youth, wisdom, hand in hand. Oh, how I'd like to see you both together. Ah! And for her birthday, you're giving her the gift of music. How touching. What is the price of the piano? You are taking your young bride out somewhere tonight. A quiet nook. Where you can be lost together in the midst of this great city. Looking into each other's eyes. How much? And where's the tag? Ah. Oh. And worth every penny. A bit of restoration to take care of the finish. The mechanism still works, so on. Since it's a birthday present, let's say, we'll take 20% off of that. No, no, make it 40. Forget the sales tax. Done. I shall require delivery before 6 o'clock this evening. The address is on my check. Certainly. I wouldn't want a lady to be disappointed on her birthday. How oh, remarkable. And what's that? Are you aware of how susceptible you are? I am. To the power of music. Isn't everyone? To some degree, I suppose. Okay, okay. You got a sale. Now, you gonna stand around all day taking my time? No, I was just leaving. Well, nobody's stopping you. There's the door. Tell me, are you sentimental about anything else besides birthdays? Birthdays? They're a lousy waste of time and money. Huh. It was the piano, wasn't it? <laughs> Extraordinary. Good day to you. Marvin? Marvin! Oh, uh, good evening, sir. Take my hat and coat, please. Very good. Oh, the piano arrived, I see. Uh, about an hour ago. I took the liberty of, of dusting it, sir. Marvin? Yes, Mr. Fortune? If you're going to wait on the guest tonight, then do something about your face. 
my face, sir? Yes, Marvin. A party is supposed to be a happy occasion. Could you manage to look a little less miserable than usual? I, uh... I will try, sir. Do that. Anything will be an improvement. You may make my evening martini now. Right away. Is that you, Gerald? Yes, Esther. Hello, darling. How was your day? Oh, fine. The museum again with a friend. Been going there quite a lot lately. I have. You said you wanted me to improve my mind. Indeed. One can never know too much. And what else would you like me to do? Well, there is one thing. And that would be? You might consider letting Marvin go. What do you mean? Show him the door. Give him the sack. In short, find a replacement, and as soon as possible. Oh, really, Gerald? I'm quite serious. What has he done now? It isn't anything he's done. It's his appearance. He seems the same as always. Well, that's the trouble. It's the way he looks. I can't bear coming home only to be confronted by that lugubrious expression on his face. I find it unspeakably depressing. Don't you? Not particularly, Gerald. Look at him, like a hound dog, ready to burst into tears at any moment. Surely we can find a servant who's more cheerful to have around. Keep your voice down. Why? There's no need to hurt his feelings. The man has no feelings. He's a clod. Gerald. You haven't commented on the piano. I was about to. You don't care for it? I love it. I really do. Have you tried it yet? I didn't know how, so I decided I'd wait until you got home. I knew you wanted to play. That's why I got it for you. Hardly any need. Hmm. The piano plays itself. Oh, you noticed. Wasn't that considerate of me? I thought I'd save you the trouble of all those tedious lessons, only to find out at the end that you had no gift for music. I see. Well, darling, aren't you moved by my thoughtfulness? Thank you, child. Let's have a demonstration, shall we? If you like. Marvin, is this thing plugged in? Yes, sir. Good. You see, these paper rolls are punched with holes. All you do is select one, insert it, and throw the switch. The paper passes over the slots and the keys move up and down as if someone were playing them. What fun. Quite the rage in the old days. Your drink, sir. In a moment. Now then, for example, here's one called Smiles. You open the panel, press it into place like this, start it on the take-up reel. <laughs> yeah, they don't write them like that anymore. <laughs> What on earth is the matter with you? Oh, nothing, sir. Nothing at all. Marvin, are you all right? I'm very well, thank you, madam. Oh, but you're smiling. Am I? You most certainly are. That's probably because I'm happy. Have you been drinking my martini? No, sir. Well, then what do you have to be happy about? Everything, sir. I make good money, got a nice place to live, my health, money in the bank. I like my job. Well, you can't. I treat you atrociously. Oh, ho, ho, ho. you don't bother me, Mr. Fortune. You, <laughs> you tickle me. What? Oh, yes. Sometimes it's all I can do to keep from laughing out loud when you have one of your tantrums. I get a kick out of it. When you go around, you know, flicking the table to be sure I've dusted, or or checking the silver to see if it's polished. <laughs> you you are funny, Mr. Fortune. Am I? Yes, quite. Downright hilarious, if the truth be told. <laughs> Why, Marvin, I've never heard you speak like this. <laughs> Nor have I. Well, hell, there's plenty more where that came from. I've got a million of them, sir. A million of them. Well, out with it, man. You're quite the comedian today. <sighs> 
sorry. Sorry if I spoke out of place, sir. Well, on the contrary, Marvin, I'm glad you did. Will there be anything else, sir? Not at the moment. You may go now. Very good, sir. What a strange thing to happen. Wasn't it, though? An odd moment for us all. Most definitely. Who'd have thought that behind that gloomy exterior, the man was concealing a sunny nature? I can't imagine how it happened. I believe I can. I'd say it was because of something extraordinary that has come into our lives. Something absolutely extraordinary. So, what really happened, Gerald? Marvin behaved so strangely a moment ago, and then he stopped suddenly. Well, perhaps it's not so strange after all. I've always believed that we have two faces, the one we wear and the one we keep hidden underneath. The problem has been to find some method of revealing that hidden face. I suppose it helps if you know what particular hidden face you're looking for. But now it appears that I at least have the means. I don't understand, Gerald, and I'm not sure I want to. See you in a while. Esther, wait. Let's try another one. I have to get ready. No, no, not yet. Let's play something uh, a bit more intense. Some other time. Bear with me, Esther. An experiment, if you will. Well, what do you think of this one? I don't know what you want me to say. Go on. Don't hold back. What you're really feeling. I, ca I can't. You can. But... Uh, Let's hear it, darling. Now's your chance. You... You... Spit it out. You... Beast. That's the girl. For six years I have controlled myself, but I can't keep it in any longer. I was a stupid, naive child when I married you back in London. I thought you were a great man, but you aren't anything of the sort. You're a sadistic fiend. You take pleasure in humiliating me before your oh-so-clever friends for one simple reason. Because you enjoy hurting me. I've stood your cruelty all these years, but I won't stand for it anymore. Are you sure you're feeling well, my dear? I'm feeling very, very well. Better than I've felt in years. It's a great relief to tell you what I really think of you. It's been bottled up for so long. Go on, please. I'm listening. I thought you needed me. I thought you needed my love, but you don't. All you need is to have someone around to bully and torture whenever you feel like it. I've tried to love you. Heaven knows I have tried, but I hate you. I honestly hate you. <laughs> Bravo. I'm, I'm terribly sorry. May I congratulate you on a remarkable performance? Had it been on stage, my dear, I would have given you a superlative review. I, I don't know what possessed me. I do. That was your hidden face. I've suspected for years that beneath your unemotional facade, you were an hysterical little girl, and I was right. But how? Haven't you seen what's in the record shops these days? There is music for every conceivable occasion. Music for a rainy day, music for a romantic dinner, music to read by, music to dance by, music to dream by, music to do everything under the sun by. Could it be that this anachronistic old piano, the product of a more sensible time, has provided music to help us expose our hidden selves by? I, I still don't understand. Well, it's quite simple, really. Marvin was hiding his inherently happy nature, which was revealed when he heard happy music. You were concealing hysteria, and when you heard hysterical music, you couldn't hide yourself either. You mean the piano? That's exactly what I mean. I seem to have bought you a more interesting birthday present than I imagined. A kind of sonic lie detector, if you will. I wonder what other people are hiding. Our friends, for example. Gerald, please, promise me not to play the piano at my party tonight. I mean, to let it play itself. I promise no such thing. 
I wasn't looking forward to the festivities, but now I believe we may be in for a most amusing evening. Good evening, Marvin. Good evening, sir. Won't you come in? Greg, how nice to see you. Marvin, take Mr. Walker's coat. Yes, sir. I'm truly pleased that you could join us. You're unusually cordial tonight. That isn't a smile you're wearing, is it? I brought it out of storage in honor of Esther's birthday. I trust you've done the same. Not I. Smiling isn't among my plans for the evening. Drink. But of course. Oh, I'll make it for you. Marvin takes forever. I'm delighted to hear that you share my distaste for birthdays. Birthdays, anniversaries, and certain holidays I overlook whenever possible. They imply some degree of human involvement, the sort of thing I'd rather avoid. Is that true? I've been given to understand that you're something of a ladies' man, quite thickly involved, in fact. You've been misinformed. Have I? I'm much too selfish to fall in love. And you're miserable. Admit it. Not in the least. I value the peace and quiet of my bachelor's existence. It lets me write my plays without interference from anyone. How is the new play, by the way? Brilliant. Unfortunately, you'll never have the opportunity of panning it as you have my other plays. No? Why not? It won't likely be performed any time soon. I thought you said it was brilliant. No, it is. But I'm locking it away with orders that it not be produced until after my death. You see, it concerns a romantic triangle, and the three principles are rather well known. That shouldn't matter. Not if it's a good play. I'd rather not hurt anyone. I'm old-fashioned that way. Ridiculous. A great play is worth any amount of pain to any number of people, least of all three. Not these three. Sorry, old man, my mind's made up. Well, I'm sure you'll do as you see fit, as usual, regardless of anyone's opinion. For better or worse, I'm afraid. Where's your better half, by the way? Still at the makeup table, trying to obliterate the last few years of her life with powder and paint. Come, I'll show you a toy I found for her. Well, well. I haven't seen one of these old jobs in years. Mm, neither had I. Does it play? Remarkably well. Let me demonstrate. It's just this little switch here. Isn't that something? Romantic, wouldn't you say? Hmm. Is Esther pleased with it? She hasn't expressed any great enthusiasm. That doesn't sound like Esther. Has she heard this particular song? Not yet. Be sure to play it for her. She'll understand. Understand what? What you tried to do for her. Usually she's so grateful for any small sign of affection. I think that's one of Esther's most lovable qualities. Is that right? Her ability to accept a bouquet of daisies as if they were the rarest of orchids. I remember once, I gave her a small turquoise ring. It didn't cost much. You gave her a ring? Yes. She accepted it as if it were the Hope Diamond. Turquoise ring? Oh, yes. She came home from a trip with it. She'd been to Mexico City. But I seem to remember that uh, she went alone. What? Oh, she did. Strange how we ran into each other down there. A stranger still that Esther never mentioned it. Would you call that rather an odd coincidence? Not really. Jerry, has it ever occurred to you that I'm deeply in love with her? 
<laughs> My dear Gregory, you are about as capable of passion as a head of lettuce. And Esther could not rise beyond the level of a cast-off shoe. Don't speak of her that way. I will speak about her any way I please. She's my wife, or have you forgotten that? She may be, but you don't know her at all. Esther is full of love. Is she? Her skin is warm and soft as velvet. The scent of her is enough to drive a man wild, and her hands are so gentle, sweet to kiss and to hold. She is honey and gold and and summer days and singing and the feeling of being together. Gerald, no, turn it off. <laughs> I'm sorry you did that, Esther. I don't know when I've been so entertained. And you, Greg, why would you say such things? Uh, sorry, Esther, I, I don't know what came over me. It's just as well. I never enjoyed deceiving you, Gerald. My dear, you are incapable of deceiving me. I've known for years your capacity for doing any number of sordid little things. The only revelation tonight has been the specific details of an unsavory affair. I'd better leave. Oh, don't be a schoolboy. We're in for a grand time this evening. Ah, our other guests are arriving. Before I welcome the Mester, may I wish you a happy birthday? I hope that your next 40 years will be equally rewarding. What are you up to? Why, nothing, dear. Simply being the perfect host. I'll, I'll get it, sir. Don't bother, Marvin. I prefer to do the honours myself. Jerry, please don't play the piano again tonight. It's not something to fool around with. I'm not fooling around with it, Esther. I'm using it with deadly accuracy. Hi there, Jerry. What happened to Marvin? Uh, here, Miss Moore. Good evening. Marge, dear, do come in. Marvin will take your wrap. Well, don't just stand there, Gerald, devouring me with your eyes. I know what's on your mind. Oh, kiss me, you fool. Like this? Oh, that's better. Marge, I'm quite vexed with you. You are? You promised the next time we saw you, you'd be svelte as an antelope. And what am I now? Oh, don't answer that. <laughs> I've been on more diets than a jockey has horses. Somehow they always throw me before we reach the finish line. Esther, happy birthday. Hello, Marge. I have a present for you. Margie. And you, I'm not even speaking to you, handsome. You haven't called me in months. Somebody else been taking my place? As a matter of fact, yes. We've just had a most illuminating discussion about Greg's new romance. Gerald, don't tell me who she is. I may go after her with my claws. Worse yet, you could sit on her and mash her to death. <laughs> Same old Jerry. <laughs> now, who's going to make me a drink? Marvin will take care of you. I believe another stagecoach has arrived. Jerry, are we early? Oh, not at all. You're just in time. Darling, you look positively radiant. How do you do, Mr. Fortune? Pleased, I'm sure. And uh, you are... Oh, this is Roberto, my escort. Ah, I would never have guessed. And how is everyone at the Last Chance Ranch these days? Oh, Jerry, <laughs> behave. Come in, come in. You might want to fasten your seatbelts, though. Something tells me this may be an evening to remember. Ooh, how exciting! What do you have in mind? Charades or strip poker? Something even more revealing than that. How about a game of ultimate truth or dare? Pick up the empty glasses, will you, Marvin? Yes, sir. Everyone, let me have your attention, please. What's he got in mind? Over here, by the piano. Some sort of surprise. 
surprise. That's it. Take whatever chair you like. If there aren't enough seats, the floor will do. This should be fun. Don't worry, it's quite clean. Oh, not for me, thanks. I'd never be able to get up. <laughs> now then, the hour has arrived for fun and games. Well, about time. Being friends of Esther's and mine, you are perhaps inclined towards such intellectual pastimes as pin the tail on the donkey and spin the bottle. Now you're talking. I want to be it. Not this time. I've decided that tonight, rather than cater to your juvenile side, we might try a more adult game. I'm hungry. When do we cut the cake? Compulsive eaters will find hors d'oeuvre within arm's reach. Now, for our game, I shall need a volunteer. For what? You can't trust Fitzgerald. No telling what he's got up his sleeve. Must we, Gerald? Indeed we must. Hold up your hands. No one? Very well, then. In the absence of a volunteer, I shall have to conscript someone. How about Marge Moore? OK, Svengali, I'll play along. What's the caper? Nothing physically demanding, my dear. I merely want you to listen to some music on the piano. What kind of music? Let me see. How about, um, Claire de Lune? Isn't that beautiful? Look at her. She's going into some kind of trance. <laughs> this is going to be good. Talk to me, Marge. Tell me what you're feeling now. My name is not Marge. It's not? What is your name? Tina. That's a pretty name. Tell me about yourself. What do you want to know? Who are you, Tina? A little girl. And what do you like to do, Tina? I like to dance. Good girl. Would you like to dance for us, Tina? All right. <laughs> Shh. Thank you, Tina. You may stop dancing now. That was fun. Tell me, do you always dance? Only when I'm Tina. And who are you the rest of the time? Might it be uh, Marge? Sometimes I pretend I'm a snowflake. Really? White and tiny and perfectly formed, I float on the air of a pale blue moonlit night. I am never lonely. I am beautiful and I am loved. I see a man with his hand outstretched to receive me. Very handsome man. He sees me and knows that I am beautiful. I drift down until I reach his hand. I am enclosed in warmth. I... I melt with love. What? What? Where am I? Never fear. It's all in fun, my dear. What have I done? Nothing. Only an amusement for our guests. Why? Because I asked you. You were very compliant. But why me? Now, now, I chose you because I thought you could take a joke. Jokes are supposed to be funny. You think I'm funny, is that it? Not at all. Jerry, haven't we had enough of the piano? Not quite. I thought we'd perform one more listening test. For what possible purpose? To call forth the person who lives within someone else. And who might that be? Oh, I've been trying to make up my mind. What would be entertaining? A politician? A poet? A Broadway producer? 
Alas, I fear that there are none in our midst. Still, we must go for the big finish. So before the curtain falls, why not hear from the devil himself? What? <laughs> Gerald, please. The only question is, in whose breast does he reside? No one here, surely. This is ridiculous. Is it? Where's your spirit of scientific inquiry? There's nothing very scientific about this. A cheap parlor trick to embarrass people. Easy, Greg. We're all friends here, aren't we? Nonetheless, I doubt that I shall get a suitable volunteer, but it doesn't matter. Esther, put this role on the piano. What is it? Faust. If there's a devil among us, we'll know it soon enough. I don't think I like this. Why not? Are you the Prince of Darkness? Hardly. Then bear with me a moment longer. It might be edifying, a process of elimination, if you will. Esther, the piano. But... Now. Very well. And you thought this would be a typical birthday party. I think we'd better be going. Oh, but the game's not over. I think it is. Really? It's late. Just another minute. You'll see. It'll be worth it. Don't. I have to. Not that role. Something else. Greg, thank you. You've just given me an idea. Esther? Yes? We're waiting. Here. It's ready. That's not Faust. What is it? Brahms, I think. Yes, his lullaby. That's not what he asked for. Gerald, I seem to have made a mistake. Will this one do? Gerald? Gerald, can you hear me? What's good for the goose, I always say. Speak to us, devil. Go on, out with it. I am I'm a, afraid. Do tell. And what are you afraid of, devil? I'm afraid of the dark. You're no devil. Listen to your voice. You're a frightened little kid. That's supposed to be a secret. It is, huh? Do you have another secret? Go on, tell us all your secrets, Jerry. This moment will never come again. For once, you're center stage. You have an audience in the palm of your hand. Yes, Jerry. Tell us. I'm afraid of you all. Afraid of people. But why? Who are you, really? A small boy. I've stayed hidden away inside. But now, I can't hide anymore. And what do you like to do, little boy? hurt people. I can't stop from doing it. It's all I like to do. Why am I not surprised? Did you know I envy you, Marge? I'm too afraid to, to embrace the world as you do, and in my envy the boy tries to hurt you. Who else do you envy? Greg, are you here? Yes. I've tried to hurt you too. I've given bad reviews to your plays when I should have given praise. I've coveted your talent because I had none of my own, and so I hurt you in every way I could. For once, I have to agree with you. I think we'd better go. I think that's a good idea. Thank you all for coming. Yes. I'll call you. Take care, Esther. We love you. I'm sorry you had to see this. Good luck. Esther. I've hurt you most of all. You came to me with love, but I couldn't accept it because it frightened me. I never learned how to return love except as a child does with shrieks and blows and indifference. It must have been very, very difficult for you. Good night, Esther. Call me if you need me. But I do. Wait. Where are you all going? I don't want you to leave. Come back. Esther, come with me now. Will you do that? Yes. Yes, I will. Let me get my curtain purse. 
Don't leave me. If you do, I'm going to be very, very naughty. Ready? I'm ready. No! No, please! They were laughing. I'm sure of it. Nobody laughs at me. I'll show them. I'll show them all. See, I'm being bad. Very, very bad. Stop that hideous music. Make it stop. There. What do you think of that? <clears throat> uh, Miss Fortune. What's happened? What's happened? What have I done? Where... Will there be anything else this evening? Are you laughing at me? Are you? Oh, no, sir. I'm most definitely not laughing. Because you're not funny anymore. Marvin! Marvin! Wait! Not you two! Don't leave me! Don't! Don't! Mr. Fitzgerald Fortune, critic, man about town, and cynic at large, whose wit shows no mercy at all for those who cross his path, which means the rest of the world. A man who went searching for a hidden cast of characters and instead found what is concealed within himself. As the house lights dim just off the Great White Way at an empty theater in the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at twilightzoneradio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. Piano in the House, starring Michael York with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etcherson and written for The Twilight Zone by Earl Hamner Jr. Heard in the cast were Sarah Wellington, Christian Stolte, Renee Matthews, Doug James, Herb Graham, Meg Falcon, Rosalind Alexander, Rick Vargas, and Kurt Nabig. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises and the Rod Serling Estate for making this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group. Sound design and custom Foley effects for The Twilight Zone by Cerny American creatives Bob Benson, Craig Lee, Michael Slabach, and Matt Sorrow. To learn more about The Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. Doug James speaking.